Good morning, and welcome to our latest summit webinar, The Retail Reset, How to Exceed Customers' Digital Expectations in 2021. This is the first webinar in a series of three, which we'll hold over the next eight weeks. This series looks at how the retail industry is effectively resetting due to the changed landscape experienced throughout the pandemic, and ultimately how retailers can and should be prepared for this reset. I'm Adrian Burns, Director of Client Strategy at Summit, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us this morning. We have a great session planned for you, which will include some insightful content, wonderful guests sharing their stories and the views on the industry today. We will be taking questions in the session, so please feel free to use the Q&A function. And don't worry if we run out of time, we'll get in touch after the event with an answer. We are recording today, so if you miss anything, we'll make sure you get a link to the video as soon as available. For those of you less familiar with Summit, I just want to give you a brief background on who we are. We're experts in performance marketing and e-commerce, and we've been around quite a long time now. We're actually going into our 21st year this year in 2021. Over the years, we've had to learn, change, and grow across our strategic and our delivery propositions. And this is really in response to the ever-evolving industry and ensuring that we're delivering agile and future-led strategies for our clients. We're proud to work alongside brands in different retail categories, such as Jules, Signet, and 3Mobile, just to name a few. At Summit, we describe ourselves as change makers in retail. And as part of our drive to live this, we've developed our own technology in-house, which includes our proprietary marketing intelligence platform called Forecaster, which has proven to drive more sales for less costs. It's agnostic of channel sitting above advertising platforms and is all about identifying where and when to spend your money to get the greatest return. And over the last two years, Summit has helped deliver over 1 billion pounds of sales for our retail client partners. So with our history, our experience, and our deep understanding of how to maximize digital strategies across retail, we feel we're in a strong position to be able to help curate conversations such as these around the key industry topics. You might have joined us uh, last year at the end um, in our previous webinar, which was a series called Changes Now. This series focused on the need for businesses to transform and pivot to become digital first. It gave retailers and brands practical advice on how to adapt and thrive during such an unprecedented time. And it covered topics such as peak in a pandemic, how to recession proof your sales plan, and how to, technology is reinventing retail. And we had speakers such as PwC, eBay, Clarks, and many more. So if you missed any of that series, you can rewatch it by visiting the events page on our website. So last year was all about recognizing that due to the pandemic, retailers and brands needed to respond quickly in that shift towards digital. This year, we see the retail industry as a whole resetting itself and looking at what is the new expected omnichannel experience. So in this series, we're looking at how digital shifts in consumer behaviors and expectations are sticking and thereby requiring brands and retailers to really reset their strategic roadmaps to meet those new normal needs. Joining me today, it's a fantastic lineup of guests. We have Beth O'Grady from Summit. We've got Sara Roberts from Healthy Nibbles and George McDonald from Retail Week. So we've got a pretty jam-packed agenda. Beth's gonna kick things off with highlighting um, some of the things we've seen in customer expectations and behaviors recently, tackling that question, you know, just what is digital transformation and having a look at some of the great digital transformation examples and how they connect to consumers. We're then gonna have a chat with Sara Roberts, founder and CEO of Healthy Nibbles, and she'll take us through the digital transformation journey brought on by the pandemic. And we're gonna have a fireside chat with George McDonald, executive editor of Retail Week, discussing the longevity of some of these trends and what the future might look like once that dust is settled. So thanks again for joining us today. I'm gonna to hand over to Beth O'Grady. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, great. So we'll start today by just chatting a little bit about what the current climate is like and customer behaviour and expectations. So we've seen in the last year that because of the pandemic and COVID, we've seen a lot of online changes, some, some a lot of shopping habits changing, and 44% of consumers expect to permanently change their shopping habits, meaning that even post-COVID, these behaviours are likely to stick. Social commerce is on the rise, so we've seen the likes of Instagram changing their platform more to focus on shopping, TikTok recently too. 
and AR. So AR and other digital solutions, shoppers are actually now starting to use it and realize that it makes their decisions easier online. And they're starting to expect people to see the, this online now. So retailers, they're starting to expect to see it online. Payment expectations too. So as people are shopping online more, they're becoming more confident in different ways to pay like PayPal, Klarna, Apple. So it's just another thing that customers are expecting to see online now. And before I get into digital transformation, I have got this quote here from Jeff Bezos. So there is no alternative to digital transformation. Visionary companies will carve out new strategic options for themselves. Those that don't adapt will fail. There's some very wise words there. But what is digital transformation? So it's something that a lot of retailers are doing in some form. We see it all of the time now. And it's something that everybody's talking about. There are a lot of quite intense articles online that you'll find that go it delve quite deep into what digital transformation actually is. And it's something that can mean a lot of different things. So I've got three examples here of what digital transformation can mean. So we've got things like new business models, we've got solving business problems, new technology to enhance capability of humans, uh, modifying existing business processes, culture, customer experiences. As you can see, there's quite a lot of jargon there. Um, but at Summit for us, um, digital transformation is quite plainly doing the stuff that customers love online. And at Summit, at our core, we are focused on performance marketing and doing what our clients' customers love online. Um, and we really like to see ourselves setting up our clients up for you know, success when it comes to their digital transformation journey, whether that is from strategy all the way through to execution. So I'm going to take us through some digital transformation makeovers, but before I do that, um, we're going to actually launch a poll just to find out where you guys are on your digital transformation. So that will pop up on the screen now and feel free just to move it along and I'll, you can answer that while we're um, going through those digital transformation makeovers. So the first example is Kath Kidson. So store closures turned into full e-commerce focus. So Kath Kidson, very sadly, went into administration in 2020. They had to close 60 of their stores on the high street. They're quite an iconic British brand, but their parent company, you know, they saw a, a future for them online and they focus on digital PR initiatives and partnerships to push Kath Kidson back into the positive limelight and just reaffirm their target audience, you know, who can still buy from them and who will find Kath Kidson really relevant. So they did this in a couple of really fun ways. So the first example here is Kath Kidson Top Dog, which was a campaign that aligned with their dog product offering. And people could essentially apply their dogs, so 14,000 dogs applied, or dog owners, and they were able to get lots of, generated lots of backlinks here as well, which will bird really well from an SEO point of view. And 11,000 people um, went, to, went to site through this. So it was a really great way just to get them back in the limelight. Another way here is through Animal Crossing. So Kath Kisson partnered with Animal Crossing, where you could actually scan a QR code to use the iconic vintage inspired Kath Kisson prints in the game, which was so clever because Animal Crossing has really made a comeback. It has just boomed, especially because of lockdown, people spending more time at home and wanting to play games more. And um, so a really clever way to get new customers, but also potentially some old customers. It might have been a little bit of a nostalgic thing seeing Kath Kisson on there. So a really good way to get in front of customers digitally. The second example here is Lego, so a full sensory and store experience replicated online. Another really, really great example of digital transformation. So Lego only have 14 stores in the UK and it has to be a really fun and immersive in-person experience you know, to get customers engaged, persuade them to make a purchase. That picture on the right is actually one that I took of my mum and my nephew when they came to visit me in London a couple of years ago. Uh, we had to take my nephew there because it's like a landmark in Piccadilly. It's all about connection with family. It's a real sensory experience. You can see, touch, hear Lego every, every turn. Um, so how do they then replicate that experience online? So the, the pandemic obviously forced stores to close and this meant that Lego had to really push their activities online. They did this via content campaigns and seamless social channel activity and they doubled their online traffic to 100 million visits. There was a trend of Lego making a comeback at the beginning of the lockdown. So they didn't necessarily have to do anything uh, exceptional online, but they did anyway. They just exceeded those expectations of them. So the first campaign here on the left 
is one called Build and Talk Campaign. Again, this is reinforcing that connection of family with kids being at home more and potentially, you know, being in, on, in front of a screen a lot more and adults being at home a lot more. It's a chance for them to make these little characters together and adults can teach while the kids learn about digital safety. It's solutionising a problem that their customers and potentially new customers as well have had over the lockdown period. The second example here is again, honing in on that sensory experience, touching hearing, hearing Lego. I thought this was so clever. It's a bit of a niche one, but if you go to the Lego Instagram, they've got this little barcode where you can scan through Spotify and it will come up with this playlist that Lego have made and it's essentially an EP of soundscapes made with Lego. So it's sounds of people like rummaging in a Lego box and clicking bricks together. It's a really nostalgic experience. And it also jumps on the trend of, you know, ASMR. I mean, you might know what that is, you might not, but people love it or hate it. It's a way to help you relax. It's a way to help people concentrate, which again, is solutionising a problem that people have had during the lockdown, not being able to concentrate and not being able to relax as much. Another great way that they've really exceeded expectations of customers here online. Pandora. So transforming the try-on experience using digital solutions. So Pandora, Pandora are just renowned for their try before, before you buy in-store experience. You know, people queue outside when it comes to, you know, Valentine's Day and Christmas, you sit, used to see it all the time on the high street because people like to go in-store to make these kind of purchases. You know, with jewellery, you feel more confident when going in-store because you want to try it on, you want to check that it's 100% right, especially when it's maybe a higher end purchase. So they have just transformed online recently and um, they've introduced these new ways to shop safely and most importantly, an, an AR solution. And that's my hand there on the right, uh, me trying on some rings. I just thought it was a really clever way. AR can sometimes be seen as a bit of a fad, but this is definitely a really, really helpful way that users who may have wanted to once go in store to try on rings, decide between a few rings. This is a really great way to, to be able to do that online. My next example here is three. So in-store customer service turned into seamless online experience. So three, they have an extensive store network in the UK. They have around 310 stores. It's very rare that you will go down High Street and not see a three store or some other mobile network store. And there's a reason for that. And that's because people like to talk to a human being, another person who is an expert in this area, because it can be confusing when buying a mobile phone or a new contract or changing contracts, or if you've got a problem, speaking to a person is what most people would like to do in this situation. So when obviously stores close, they react to this and they have created a seamless digital experience. They introduced something called Three Store Now and you're able to actually communicate with your own personal shopper who is essentially an in-store advisor and they can answer all of your questions. You know that it's a real person, they're in the store. So it's like you're in the store too with them. Really, really clever way um, to meet the customer's needs there. But another way they've gone a little bit further is live product demos. I thought this was really quite cool and clever product demos and product releases is something that you would probably align to a brand like Apple and um, you know it's quite a high spec thing to do and a lot of people from a tech point of view will be really interested in seeing this so it's a really clever way for three to maybe get some new customers or get some different eyes in front of their in front of their online platform. The next example is Specsavers. So they have been on an incredible digital transformation in the last year. And so they've gone from in-store only purchases to a full tradable website. So until March, 2020, you could only really trade with Specsavers in-store and they relied on this you know, traditional way to shop. So people would go in, do the eye test, get the glasses, get the contact lenses, and maybe come back another time. Um, it's still obviously a very crucial way to shop with Specsavers that people need to go in to get their eye test, but it definitely is not the only way. Um, and they realized this when it came to the pandemic, they really accelerated their digital transformation plans. Um, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, they have this like full e-commerce journey now online, um, followed by a full set of services to meet the customer's needs. So they introduced something called remote care, which is a really great way, like a virtual appointment, something that's become increasingly unpopular increasingly popular not just in the medical industry um, so you can make your appointment and talk to an expert and a professional and you can get any site or hearing advice that you need without having to leave your home 
They also launched multiple PR campaigns via social channels to build on consumer confidence, which is crucial. If you are a store that is you know, renowned for something being offline or an in-store experience, you still need to be able to serve the people that are online in front of you, which we have something to know is just it is crucial at the moment to be able to do that. So they did something called lockdown stories, among many other things that you'll probably see on social, um, where people told their stories of how Spexive has you know, helped them in some way during the lockdown and some quite unique experiences. It's just a way to build on that confidence and make sure everyone knows that Spexive is there still open for you. And my last example here is Jules. So Market Town stores mirrored online through a gifting marketplace. So Jules, they started out by selling wellies in Market Towns. They really focus on this Market Town audience. They open stores across the UK that have this country look and feel. They have a product offering target audience that is so refined, it's so well suited, and they have a really, really great, great customer base. And they have just gone one step further than they needed to. So they've got this great successful e-commerce offering online anyway. But now they've introduced this extensive gifting market marketplace called Friends of Jewels. And this is a gifting and crafting community, essentially. There's small businesses on there, there's like inspiring individuals, you know, they bring this collection of new gift ideas to see. And the they're just honing in on so many different trends here. There's a trend of buying from small independent businesses. So they're essentially helping these independent businesses have a platform. The rise of marketplaces, so places everyone is now used to shopping on the likes of Amazon, ASOS, not on the high street, places like that where you can buy a collection of different things from different categories and buy it all at once in one purchase. This is something that Friends of Jewels does so, so well and just completely exceeds the, the expectations of them online. So all of the customers are doing that all the, they're doing exactly what customers love online and they've really honed in on what their clients want and they've navigated through a pandemic and seen how you know customer behaviors have changed and reacted to that and you know again their expectations through digital transformation they've they've all smashed it and we are very proud at Summit to have worked with some of these uh, brands and retailers uh, whether that's with their digital or omni-channel or performance marketing in some way we're very proud to have worked with them um, and on this note, I think it would be the perfect time to go back to Adrian, uh, where she will be talking to Zara Roberts about her um, own digital transformation journey. Thanks, Beth. Lots of great examples there of um, how brands are considering their customers' needs um, and that offline customer need, and then looking at bringing that online. Welcome, Sara. Thank you. It's nice to Thank have you, you join us. Um, so, you know, I think actually when I was learning about Healthy Nibbles and we were chatting earlier about it, there's a really kind of interesting story that sparked um, how the brand kind of came about. And you've gone through quite a journey, you know, throughout the pandemic. It'd be great if you could give us a little bit of background around how it actually started. Yeah, certainly. So Healthy Nibbles is, was basically started as a healthy vending machine company. That's, that was our initial product. And that came from an us the usual sort of aha moments that many founders sort of speak of. So for us, um, it was my personal experience and I was in a hospital. It was three o'clock in the morning. I was hungry, usual sort of stress purchase, went to a vending machine, but next to it um, was a poster that's automatically just about the same size of the vending machine, same diabetes and obesity kill. And in that moment, there was this sort of juxtaposition between what the hospital was trying to communicate versus what was actually available in the machine and they ended up walking away empty-handed and thought this really needs to change and that's essentially where we started our journey we've since gone on to sort of develop other products um, such as snack boxes and wellness hubs and and then obviously adapting to the sort of more recent changes so yeah we've um quite a journey, still actually feels almost like the first year. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> lots more to come. <laughs> oh, for sure. And so how, how would you say the pandemic, you know, impacted directly your business? And, and how did that make you think about how you needed to kind of pivot or react to that? To be fair, it was actually quite startling uh, and quite frightening initially, um, especially as a founder. Um, we, on the vending side of the business, putting it in perspective, we went from thousands of revenue to £3.50 a week following the lockdown of um, 
the first lockdown. So you can imagine my daughter has more pocket money than that. Um, a little bit scary from a business perspective and not a sort of position that you want to find yourself in. But then very quickly, we've been able to adapt and sort of strengthen the other areas of the business to accommodate for that. And whereas we do see it growing on the vending side, there are other elements to the business. So the immediate response, um, I, I guess once everybody sort of got themselves, you know, into that sort of tech space that they could work from home and things like that were starting to sort of move forward, were things like employee care pack boxes, which we did and we still do. And that's the bulk of what we're doing at the moment. Um, really that opportunity for a company to provide a cultural touch point initially and that I would say the reason for those boxes going out has changed over the last 12 months in the first sort of lockdown it was very much about looking after the well-being of your team saying don't worry we're going through a scary situation but hey we care and that's what it was about then move on a couple of months and a lot of the events exactly as we're doing now went to virtual and event managers were frequently in touch about creating that touch point for an event. So various different sort of promotional items, event collateral, things like that. I think moving forward and what we're starting to see now is a connection and sort of as people are talking about returning to work and what that may look like in the future of the workplace, really the flexibility is going to stay stay with us i think you know for the rest of our working lives i don't i don't foresee we're all going to be back sort of you know 10 12 hours a day fixed into an office location so what our boxes are doing now are providing that cultural touch point so reminding employees that this is who you're working for this is what we do we this is what we love about working with you having you as part of the team and encouraging the well-being, obviously well, the well-being agenda has risen exponentially over this. And, and that's one of the things that COVID has accelerated is that sort of commitment for employee well-being and employee engagement. And that's where we're finding, obviously, our strength lies in, lies in that and lies in that engagement process. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's interesting when we, I guess, look back to the end of last year and this kind of panic brands and retailers are having about getting online and then delivering services that way right and now this year it feels like it's more about how do you rebuild that connection with your customers and or help them rebuild it with their customers um, as you know online has boomed and there's so much competition out there the ones that are going to stick are the ones that actually can still give that meaningful connection like you said and so it, it's great to see how you know these kind of healthy boxes are helping employers connect with their employees and create that bond that maybe they would have done at I don't know away days or you know office events and that kind of thing and and also showing they care about well-being and and health and um you know not being alone effectively when everyone's kind of still working in their in their at-home bubble so thinking about that, and that's obviously been a bit of a change for you from the physical the vending machine side to kind of transforming into these um, delivery, you know, product propositions. How has digital played a role through that journey for you? So one key thing that we have be, that we did start doing, and that was probably quite late on, actually, in the whole sort of catalyst of change um, back in October was we started to explore more and more the consumer side of the market. So actually, the, up to then, the majority of our sort of, the website experience was very much geared towards B2B. So we've had to integrate more of that sort of consumer angle to our purchasing and buying behavior. I would say the social engagement and the content that we created, again, was around that emotional element, that touch point constantly. Whereas now we're having to look at the more work across sort of consumers, what are consumers looking for and really start responding to that. And actually they do, they do marry very, very well, because at the end of the day, all consumers are, or many consumers are employees as well. So the messaging around that is, is actually very similar. And you touched on it there with the emotional connectivity, the 
the first lockdown was almost, we were in spring, so it was brighter days. It was almost, an L, there was a, a sort of touch of the sort of, I don't know, people enjoy, didn't necessarily have as much panic. They had more sort of enjoyment of longer days, not doing the commute. They were seeing more of the benefits. I think with the last two, they've, been, they've had a different slant to them, um, potentially because we're in winter, darker months and things like that. So we've been exploring, the digital for us has been very much around content around that. So how to combat loneliness, how to set, um, you know, compartmentalize the day so that you're not having an entire blurred work-life balance and sort of it, just nothing really sort of gelling very well. Um, and how to, how to sort of encourage positive nutritional behavior points and exercise and mental well, well-being. And that's the big thing that we're seeing is that mental health and the nutrition coming together in a really sort of monumental fashion, actually. It's one of those that we've been talking about for years and actually it's really now starting to sort of take shape very, very well. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, what the way that you explained that kind of connection broader than just the product, you know, in terms of what it means for people is similar when we look back at the example Beth showed uh, the Lego example and how Lego is looking at what matters to their customer group above and beyond the product, right? You know, thinking of digital safety and helping their consumer group, you know, think about that. Um, and it's, it feels like that's where you're going as well in terms of the product, um, looking at how can you actually tie it into, you know, what it really is about beyond that, the well being and, and the, the kind of wellness side um, for that consumer base. Absolutely. I think when you look at where we started as an individual vending machine, you know, so that, yes, we had a number of, we've always been very data orientated. So live feeds from our machines and the ability to select based on a dietary preference or an allergy. So we've been always sort of driven technology at the forefront of that, but how that has evolved to where we are now. Um, we see ourselves, we've got three different um, sort of, should we say, key product areas. So vending boxes, we launched um, Wellness Hubs, which is an unmanned retail concept. And we launched that in autumn last year. But then the messaging that we originally had in sort of, you know, six years ago around sort of making those healthier choices and the impact that that actually has on productivity to where we are now, where actually nutrition is seen as a core um, response and an engagement sort of tool for mental health issues and for um, encouraging. It's almost like they, they sit with exercise and sort of activity together. So one, I'm sure many people find this, once you start exercising, then you want to eat better, or if you're eating better, you want to exercise more. They, they all go hand in hand. And I think what the COVID experience has done is really raise the bar on that and really sort of make that more prominent and make people think about it in a more sort of holistic manner. Yeah, definitely, I agree. And, and you're starting to see, I think now in this year when we were learning more about customers' behaviors that are sticking, you know, we've we had a lot of consumers um, prefer to shop, let's say, in store or to have the physical experience with a brand, get the advice face to face, that type of thing. And now they're becoming more and more confident being online. And this is where this digital transformation shift is so important, not just having a presence online, but actually portraying what your brand is about to your consumers and being able to do that successfully is quite hard. Um, and so it sounds great, like you've got all the right kind of components pulled together to really mirror who your brand is um, in that digital space. How did you find, you know, you, you mentioned, you touched on social and, and some of the areas that you've picked up and, and developed since um, making that shift into that space. How did you find that initial step or that initial journey to launching that type of approach was it quite difficult is it scary it's been an interesting sort of experience and we're very much I would say very much in the early stages of it and we're, we're sort of moving forward the website's going through redesign and things like that so there's definitely continual processes taking place I think it was um being more obvious with some of the key things that we're actually doing. So for instance, for us as a business, you touched on things like your values. 
we're quite discreet about that and discreet about some of the things that we're actually doing that are really quite incredible. So, you know, having things, we're based in Scotland. So we've got the Scottish Business Pledge that looks at environmental and sustainability impacts. We have investors in young people and oh, lots of different initiatives that we've managed to secure. We've gone on to completely plastic free packaging. It's all recycled materials, which are curbside recyclable. We've moved to water-based inks. And all of those things, it was sort of bring it, raising the awareness around that. So because that is important because customers are getting more, they're not bothered about companies that are sort of doing a nod to sustainability and impact. They actually want to see you living and breathing and eating it. So it's, I think it's that sort of authenticity piece, essentially. I think there was a lot more on curation as well that we've done. So you know, if you look at the range of boxes, we launched two really exciting ones quite recently. We've launched one that is free from all 14 major allergens. So it's entirely allergen safe. That was an evolution actually from a um, corporate setting where event organizers were dealing with lots of different participants that didn't necessarily have all the dietary requirements. So there was a demand led in that sense. But that's a really exciting one because there's so many people's allergies, there's over 2 million in the UK alone. Um, so that was an exciting one. And then a kid's box, because we're sort of, you know, trying to encourage the kids to engage in healthier behaviours, they're at home more, they're on the screens more. So there's recipe cards in there and mental health activities. So it was just bringing what we did in a corporate world into more that sort of home setting and how can we make it more relevant. And I think we'll continue on that. And there's obviously a lot more that we can be doing in terms of making it an even more curated experience mm -hmm. when people are online. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, you touched on two big parts there. One is having that or tapping into the audience and the audience's needs, you know, and um, I didn't know it's 2 million people in the UK with allergies. That's a lot. Um, so that sounds like a perfect, you know, product mm -hmm. that's going to suit that need. But you also touched on the, I guess, being more transparent with values and with um, things like sustainability and, and all of those areas that maybe for many companies and, and retailers and brands used to be on a page hidden in the website, you know, and now actually it's, it's not just something that consumers want to tick a box on. It's when the package arrives, they need that reminder of how they're contributing or how their choices are contributing to you know a healthier planet or um, you know safer distancing measures you know and all of that type of stuff. So I think that's quite exciting that you're pulling that to the forefront a little bit more um, in your transformation as well. So what's next for Healthy Nibbles? You talked about two boxes just launched. Um, what are you thinking about as a next step for that digital transformation journey or or product journey with consumers? So we've got two key things that we're working on at the moment and one's live and go, slowly starting to go out is workplaces return, which is our wellness hubs. And the wellness hubs are essentially an unmanned cafe um, with a wellness space attached to it. Now that wellness space could be anything from a studio space that can be used for flexible sort of well-being, anything from a class to a lecture. Um, or it could just simply be a touch screen with well-being information that directs people, directs employees to um, the wellness activities that the companies are operating. In terms of the actual retail experience, it's entirely contactless. There's no people there. It offers fresh, frozen snacks and there's grab and go kits for the end of the day. So it's essentially um, a healthy cafe situated within a workplace. It answers so many different, um, or it responds to so many different demands from the COVID side of things, um, from obviously a wider range of products. It's flexible, so we're highly responsive because it's real-time feeds. So we know how many people have eaten, when they've eaten. That not only helps the company and save money and um, because there's minimal wastage because you're far more responsive, but it also looks at the environmental because we're not actually having to refill unless there's a need to refill. Um, the payment is 100% cashless, um, so it's safe. It's also 24-7, which is a key thing as far as building health. 
um, because obviously prior to COVID, we've all, we've all been encouraged to take lunch and to socialize and to engage. And now we're told actually to keep your distance and separate. So rather than funneling a workforce into eating at a certain point of time, you're actually able to spread that over the, the entire duration that somebody's in the office. So that's really exciting. And then we've got um, a startup work in the process, which is in stealth mode at the moment. So I'm kind of semi tight lit, but it's a nod to personalized nutrition and how we can actually bring about the evidence and the, sorry, the research that's out there at the moment around the importance of nutrition on so many different aspects of our health and really combating some of those big um, problems that we face um, globally. So diabetes, obesity, ill health from poor disease, from poor diets. Um, and again, equally staggering, there's 11 million deaths a year due, due to poor diet. So, you know, we need yeah. to do, create healthier environments, but not in a sort of mad media frenzy way that sort of puts fear into people, but actually giving control back to people in terms of how they can improve their habits on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's all very exciting. It's, it's interesting to see your story, you know, if you were to put on a timeline from that vending machine scenario, <laughs> solving a problem that you experienced yourself to effectively creating a, a kind of hub space that really looks into multiple issues and, and personalization and, you know, direct to consumer. So it's, it sounds like a lot of exciting things coming up and we'll definitely, uh, you know, watch this space to see, see how you get on with your new projects. But thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in a little bit for some maybe Q and A or final thoughts, but thank you, Sarah. No worries. Wonderful. So I'm gonna ask George uh, to join us now, George McDonald. Hi. Hi, George, how you doing? Very well, thanks. Good to join you. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. So, George, you know, you've seen quite a, a few examples there that Beth showed in terms of some of the, the ways that retailers are um, meeting customers' expectations now digitally where they might have done so offline. I really wanted to have a chat with you and get your thoughts around what are some of those, let's call them digital trends for the sake of it, that you think are actually um, going to stick around for the next you know, chunk of time or may not stick around. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think, uh, I guess the first thing is that the trend will stick around, um, you know, the, the sort of shift that there's been to online during the pandemic, uh, you know, it's here to stay. Um, I'm sure it will continue to grow um, in at various speeds, maybe not quite as fast as it did, obviously, when we were all cooped up. Literally this morning, Asda has announced a restructuring as part of which it will create a lot more store-based but online roles. So uh, <clears throat> that big trend is here to stay. Um, I think you, you brought out some interesting examples um, in the presentation earlier that, that Beth made. So I think um, in, in more detail, uh, things that are useful and that add value for the shopper are here to stay. So for instance, um, you could really see why uh, what Pandora had done would be valued by one of their customers. Uh, it was a really useful service. Um, and uh, similarly with uh, what Specsavers had done, mm -hmm. um, it was replacing digitally some of the um, things that, uh, you know, in previous times you had completely relied on stores for. Um, and I think that sort of thing, uh, when it's done well, will, will remain. Um, there's been a couple of other uh, developments, I think, um, during the pandemic too, which I think will um, accelerate. Uh, so, you know, uh, th there's been increased adoption of live streaming. Um, you know, that's been done in particular, I think, uh, in, in China on things like Taobao um, and, and big name brands and retailers like uh, L'Oreal and H&M have both used live streaming. Uh, and again, you know, that's something that uh, can be really um, of value to the individual uh, shopper and the individual shopper in large numbers. 
and then um, going back, I suppose, to Pandora, where they use where they use their AR. Um, I think. Uh, when it's genuinely useful, um, that also uh, has an interesting future. And as, as you mentioned in the past, sometimes it's, it's been used in very sort of novelty-ish ways, rather than to create um, something that uh, is going to um, engage customers uh, in the long term. But uh, again, you know, some really big name businesses are, are using that. So even before the pandemic, um, people like Nike, key we're using AR to help people find the, the right fit uh, and, th and that's a little bit like the Pandora example so th those types of things uh, I'm sure um, have got a future and can be developed quite interestingly yeah definitely we were talking um, I think a week or so ago about IKEA when they had that augmented reality brought out and it was almost fun to play with but didn't seem that necessity and then as you said you know over the period of being locked down, some of those bigger choices that you would feel more comfortable going into store to do is, uh, you know, we really were searching as consumers for ways to make those decisions easier for ourselves. And that's, um, as you mentioned, the Pandora example, that's a great way um, to, to fit that need. So thinking about the future of stores as we're hopefully reopening in our new kind of um, pandemic, post-pandemic timeline, if you like, how do you think that experience is going to change or do you feel it's going to go back to, to what it was before? Um, I, I think a bit of both. Uh, after having been cooped up for so long and had so many restrictions uh, placed on us, um, I do think that uh, when some of the uh, measures are relaxed, people will be keen to, to go back and to socialise and have fun. Um, I think, uh, you know, hospitality is going to be a big beneficiary of that as soon as it reopens. Um, but I think physical stores uh, can do as well. Um, you know, it, it was quite striking. Um, Primark, in one of their recent updates, said that when they reopened, they retained all of their market share. So their customers really valued what they were getting from the Primark store proposition. Um, but I think uh, also bricks and mortar and digital will increasingly complement uh, one another. Um, so you look at, for instance, what Dixon's uh, car phone has done with its Shop Live initiative. Um, you know, that enables you to um, speak to somebody in a store. They may literally walk you around or they can show you product and give you advice and, and help you find what is uh right for you and that's bringing together um the things that you valued about visiting a shop you know we you were talking about three earlier uh you know with things like electricals you might want some quite specialist advice um and dixon's and uh, dixon's car phone is able to bring together some of the strengths of the bricks and mortar store uh with the new uh, opportunities that um are available through digital so uh, I think we'll see more of that. I think, um, you know, before the pandemic, uh, for instance, John Lewis was very much following a, a, a strategy in its stores based on experience and services. Uh, and you saw some of that shifting online, uh, and I'm sure that will continue. So um, things like uh, classes, it may be um, uh, to enable you to get the best out of something you bought, some new um, uh, piece of technology, or it may be, um, uh, you know, anything for, from yoga to uh, home decoration, things like that. Um, and again, you know, really engaging uh, the click with people's lives. Um, again, sort of blurring the digital and bricks and mortar, Lululemon bought a business called Mirror, which is a home um, sort of fitness uh, digital business. Um, and, you know, they bought that, they already had invested in it, but when they bought it out completely, um, they saw it very much uh, as playing a part in them building an experiential business, um, you know, it fitted with their whole sort of healthy lifestyle um, 
uh, appeal. Uh, so that was a, a, a good example too, I think, of people really trying to loop to the various channels and how can they genuinely complement one another and how can one, how can each reinforce the other? Yeah, definitely. I think it feels like now that kind of dust of, has settled a little bit of the panic of moving to online, we're starting to look at, okay, how can you enhance that experience and how can you rethink the physical store? I know um, we'll probably see rise of pop-ups, for example, you know, to, to give experience uh, type physical spaces as opposed to just replicating the online shop. So lots of really interesting things, as you mentioned, some big players in the field are, are um, looking at how they can purchase and develop new technologies to, to match in with their proposition. Um, thinking about brands and retailers and how they are uh, attracting and engaging with their consumer audience. Going back to that Lego example, um, you know, where they're really thinking about what matters to my consumers and, and kind of what Sara said as well with, with healthy nibbles. What are you thinking is, uh, is important for, for brands to consider in this space? You know, how, is it strong enough to just have an e-commerce offering anymore? I, I really like the Lego example because uh, it, it was very thoughtful. It was extremely relevant um, to its customers and to what was happening um, at the time as everybody shifted online. So it's a really good example of uh, a, a consumer business really engaging with um, customers and also sort of creating a sense of community as well. Um, you know, there's a bit of good corporate citizenship and I think all of those things um, can, can be developed, uh, you know, for instance, Tesco has just launched um, <clears throat> a cooking program with, with Jamie Oliver, which is all being done online, uh, and it's for uh, cooks in um, food kitchens and, and places like that to enable them um, to uh, give people uh, nutritious uh, meals. Um, so all of those things in, in different ways, um, you know, create real value. Um, so I think there are opportunities uh, out there for all sorts of companies um, to really uh, create a sense of community and engage people, which of course uh, is creates the, the, the chance to sell them things uh, as well without, without being cynical about it. But you want to be sort of a helpful part of people's lives, don't you? And I think those types mm -hmm. of initiatives do that yeah definitely i think you know the power is really and i feel anyway in the consumer's hands now you know they've navigated how to get past the hurdles of not going in store and having conversations with people um, and ultimately it's up to brands and retailers to show provide mm -hmm. more of that curated supportive experience that we saw in the example um, of jewels with the marketplaces that they're really tapping into a wider ring of How do you um, think this this marketplace or curated uh, kind of conversation is going to continue? Yeah, marketplaces are really interesting, uh, I think, uh, and they're really coming to the forefront at present. Um, so there, there are various models. There's the uh, you can get anything here through to um, very curated ones. So, uh, you know, I really like the Friends of Jewels. Um, actually, I noticed a small business that's, that's joined that marketplace. There was a piece about them in my local paper. So it sort of works in the way it's intended uh, to. Um, and, you know, it, that very curated approach is, is being taken by M&S as it brings third party brands onto its website. It wants complementary brands or those that really help it um, build further its authority in, in certain categories. So it's not trying to be, neither of those marketplaces are trying to be all things to all people, um, but they're thinking about where they can really build their um, uh, unique strengths. 
Um, but it, it, there's a big question um, to about the all things to all people marketplaces. Um, you know, people need to ask themselves, can I afford brands are going to ask themselves, can I afford not to be on them because consumers go there in, in such large numbers. Um, and, and there's an opportunity for small brands, which sort of plays into a bigger picture that, that's been happening for a while and maybe has been exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, customers, uh, a lot of them are, are looking for unique things. Um, and so they'll go to places like not on the high street during the pandemic. They may also have been um, buying things more locally and they'll have come across both local re food retailers or local uh, retailers of other products that people wanted then. And they found that they're really good and they'll seek them out on marketplaces. And when you have so many small businesses grouped together on a, a site like Amazon for more established uh, retailers, you face that issue of uh, are you going to be eaten by a million minnows it used to be the big sharks you were frightened of but now you have all these um, often very very good small companies that are growing online and uh, you know they're all having a little incremental effect on the wider retail landscape definitely you know you're you're completely right there and um, it's it's an interesting time I think for retail. So we've got a bit of time now just to answer a couple of the questions. I wonder if we want to invite uh, Sara back in as well. I think, oh, there she is. Very prompt. Hi, Sara. Hi. So I've actually got a question um, for you. So what digital channels have worked best for you in, in your pivot? And where do you see your focus moving to when businesses return to their workplaces? Um, sorry, was that that for me? Sorry, you just broke up slightly. Yes. Sorry, it's you know typical sorry. internet I know, issues. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the channels that work best, um, I would say Instagram in terms of social channels um, is definitely and LinkedIn, um, and they really reflect the two different sort of core groups that we're actually working with. In terms of where we see going back, I. I think there is a, a fundamental shift in terms of workplace um, side of things. So I think retaining our box solution in that sense as a cultural connection point and a uh, sort of encouragement around health and well-being for employees is going to be absolutely where we'll continue to see, see growth. The unmanned retail um, hubs, so the wellness hubs, I think they're going to play a stronger role as well moving forward as bigger businesses have more flexible work working patterns and therefore where they may have had a number of thousand employees on one single site that may be more fragmented throughout the week to sort of accommodate for um, more flexible working and I see more personalization and a sort of larger push on our direct consumer um, sort of activities where we can actually curate and allow the customer to curate more about more more in terms of what snacks they want in their box and what sort of supplements potentially you know it's pretty exciting yes very exciting thank you and um george we have one for you as well um do you think the change in customer behaviors and habits are going to stay and the death of the high street is going to continue. I know we touched a little bit on this in terms of high street experiences, and you mentioned you think it's a bit of both. But yeah. what are your kind of final thoughts on that? Well, I'd, I'd like to be optimistic about high streets. Um, I do think uh, there, there is an opportunity out of all this. Um, I think, ironically, for them to be successful, they will be less about retail. Um, you know, we've lost uh, businesses like Debenhams and Arcadia from the high street, uh, and that's really sad. Um, but their problems predated uh, the, the pandemic. Um, if you think about what uh, makes a really uh, attractive place. It goes back to some of the things that we were talking about. It really needs to be engaging. Um, so hospitality plays an important part there, as do services, um, you know, whether local government or health and all that sort of thing. But the shops that remain there, 
have got to be good enough to draw customers. You've got to want to go to them. Um, I think in terms of working from home, that's going to be interesting because, uh, you know, I don't think everyone is going to go back to the office five days a week. Let's say they go um, three days a week. Uh, so in a lot of locations, to all intents and purposes, you've lost two days of footfall. Um, and so that has implications for the types of business that can successfully trade there or the types of places that they may choose to uh, focus on. To go back to that lo localization point, it may mean that um, you know, businesses that have been very city centre focused may see opportunities in um, different places for the sake of argument, market towns or um, in big cities, the, the sort of town centres within um, the greater city. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, I really want to thank both of you for your time. Um, Sarah Roberts, the founder and CEO of Healthy Nibbles, and George McDonald, the executive editor of Retail Week. Thank you guys so much. It's been a great kind of uh, kick off or launch, if you like, for um, this Retail Reset webinar series. Just to wrap up before we, we go, um, we are really keen at Summit to help uh, all of you guys who have joined this webinar in your transformation journey. So we will be entering you into a participant prize draw. There's no obligation to take it up, but you'll have the chance of choosing from one of the three services here that best suits your business needs to support you as you go through this um, digital transformation. So you'll be able to um, choose to have a free comparison shopping on boarding with our proprietary technology product caster and 20% off all PLAs. Um, you could choose a free audit on any one of the digital marketing channels, or you could have a no obligation chat with one of our highly experienced team across you know, paid, um, paid social, SEO, PPC, affiliates, and e-commerce. So lots of different opportunities. We're really here to support you um, throughout your journey. And if you have any uh, ideas of things that you maybe want to see us chat more about in the future webinar series, or you'd like to be part of our webinar series, please do get in touch with us today with our team member, Katie. So that's katie at summitmedia.com. And thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.